Welcome to another edition of Fire and Training. I'm your host, Douglas Klein, and we're uh, actually doing the podcast from the South Carolina Fire Chiefs Association. And uh, that was a, a location that uh, Chief Halton had an opportunity to visit prior to his passing. And it's, it's just a great, great opportunity to be here. Joining the show tonight uh, is going to be uh, Britt Blackman. Britt is a training chief here in South Carolina in Lancaster County, uh, which is up on the North Carolina border uh, with South Carolina, and is uh, uh, the first vice president of the South Carolina Fire and Rescue Instructors Group. And we're just really, really excited about uh, the program. We're going to talk about some of the importance of instructors and, and how we're shaping the future and what training should really look like. And fire and training, you know, is dedicated to the men and women who are in the street. Uh, we really want to make sure we're giving them the best information we can so that everyone goes home. Being a state advocate for the Everyone Goes Home program through the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, it, it's just a, a great opportunity to share that. Uh, to, for, for the show today, four sponsors. We're really excited to have four sponsors on board. We have IFSTA. Uh, we have Tinkata, Magna Grip, and Emergency Networking. And, you know, the biggest thing that I will say is this has been around for a number of years. Uh, Tinkata makes some great turnout gear. Magna Grip, when you talk about cancer, is a huge deal of being source capture. And, of course, uh, the last one we have is Emergency Networking. So when seconds really count, responding to emergency, every second, every minute counts when you're documenting your day. The networking makes record management so much easier. So uh, thanks to all four of those. We'll mention more about those as we go through the program. But, Brett, it's great to have you on board. I uh, appreciate you having me here. Dude. You know, uh, you can't see a whole lot of, of exactly what's behind us. We're, we're sitting down on the terrace, and in our background is the Atlantic Ocean and the beach here. Uh, just in between North Myrtle and Myrtle Beach, they call this area Lake Arrowhead or Kingston Plantation. and you know, we're here at a Chiefs conference, but one of the biggest things that uh, keeps coming up, Britt, and you've heard this numerous times throughout the past two days, is about training your future and, and things about education and what we should be doing. So let's talk a little bit about that. Give me your thoughts about why it's so important. So uh, as we know, just the future of the fire service just begins with educating new members coming into the fire service and just setting that background and uh, getting their background and just starting with a solid foundation. And that comes from solid instructors, uh, just like um, we have all across this great nation uh, in this fire service. Just um, getting them into the fire service and starting that foundation so they have uh, a way to work up from there. And um, they develop this and it goes through mental programs and uh, builds from there. You know, one of our good friends uh, was here yesterday. He's an FDIC instructor, a longtime icon in the fire service with Billy Goldfeder. And one of the things that Chief Goldfeder was talking about was the company officers. And and throughout the podcast, I've mentioned this in a numerous amount of times. A lot of folks have mentioned this in numerous amount of times about just how important those company officers are in the instructional world. And how they make such a big difference. So uh, let's just kind of focus in. We'll take your department, uh, being a county department, you know, work, working with a, a larger group of people, uh, being involved at the state level, being an instructor for the State of Fire Academy, and some of the things that are going on. We know that there's a lot of changes in curriculum that are coming because of consolidations of NFPA standards. But what role do you think the company also really plays in the education of today's fire service? So the company also, when they get a, like you say, a new rookie or a new firefighter coming in, it's important that that company officer just takes that, takes that young man or young lady off. And yes, they've been in this atmosphere of classroom. And now it's time to apply it. And it's important for that company officer to really take them under their wing and truly Develop that, uh, develop that firefighter into, and have that solid foundation for them as they progress through their uh, service. So it's really about just taking ownership and being that company officer because the company officer really sets the tone for their shift for their house. Uh, is that company officer going to be slack and they come in check the trucks off and 
sit on the couch or they're going to get out and train. And how we train and how we operate uh, dictates how we operate on the scene as well. Well, you know, Chief Goldfeder talked about that a whole lot. And we do know that the company officers are the true trainers of the fire service. They're the ones that spend the most time with people and, and honestly have a huge impact. And when we're thinking about that, one of the things that comes to my mind is one of our sponsors, and that's ISTA. And, you know, with ISTA, you know, they have a, a ton of books. And, of course, all their books, you know, meet the NFPA standards. And they're dedicated to, to truly, and have been for a number of years, of updating all the techniques that go with it, the safety that's, that's created, and, and the focus that goes into those manuals. Um, they have uh, Resource One, which is part of how you can use their curriculums and, and do online programs and advance those things out, which, which helps the learning, especially when we're focused on our volunteer worlds of trying to get them involved. And, of course, you know, it's, it's good quality. It's technically accurate. It's affordable. Uh, here in the state of South Carolina, it's, it's a strong partnership between uh, the State Firefighters Association uh, and ISTA, the uh, state uses ISTA components. Uh, our students are given ISTA manuals when they're in classes. So this is a strong, strong, true relationship that's existed. And, you know, if you're interested in, in some more details, you can always visit uh, ifsta.org and actually see more information about them. But, you know, one of the things that I, I, I look at is when company officers are training, you, you know this, they get, you know, they're fire officer one. They have to go through instructor, but they're not the folks that are normally the ones out teaching curriculum classes. They're not maybe the ones down at the academy training or for the state academy, but they they can use these types of references and these types of materials to actually really impact their education at a company level. So. Uh, I know you've come through the ranks. I know you've been a company officer. I know you were involved in a lot of that. How much did you fall back on the resources that were provided to you, not only through the state, but through the department and the manuals, things like IFSTA ma uh, manuals that were put out there? Absolutely. So what I use is I actually use IFSTA uh, Resource One as a great tool for my uh, training of my uh, personnel. So uh, you can create, you can log on to IFSTA and contact them directly. And within an hour, I've always gotten a response back from Resource One. Uh, so that way I can get that training material, whether it be for preparing your personnel for the driver operator series, all the way up to the company officer level series, and even into the firefighter one and firefighter two level for uh, volunteers that we have in Lancaster County as well. Um, and it's a great tool that you go on there. It provides anywhere from PowerPoints to getting them ready for the skill evaluations and and setting that tone so that way they are more comfortable at learning environment because as we know generations learn differently um, some generations are old school and they sit down with a book in their hand and the newer generation they're more hands-on and computer oriented so uh, they provide both with this as well so um, <clears throat> with that I've always been able to uh, log in with my account and provide that provide that uh, resources for them through that issue website. Well, you know, one of the things we heard today, we actually heard the uh, superintendent of the fire academy today say this in talking. It's been said uh, by Chief Goldfeder this week. Um, I've said it a million times, and I've said it over the last couple of weeks in several programs I've done. It, back in 1979, January 29th, 7.30 p.m., I started the fire service. One of the first things I heard out of one of the older people that were there, he was an actual fire chief, and he said, I don't know what we're going to do with this next generation of fire service people. And how many times have you heard that? Uh, I, I've been in the fire service 23, 20 years now, and I've, I've heard it my whole life as well. So. And, and, you know, one of the things that really, that phrase just goes over me to the point, you know, I just, I want to explode. That's just how bad it aggravates me because... We, we think about it, and, you know, the fire service that's in there today, I mean, we're standing on shoulders of giants that, that were before us, and then there's icons and legends in the fire service now that are still active, they're still engaged. You know, we've seen several of them here with Chief Goldfeder, um, 
you know, Rick Lasky and those folks that are out there. I saw Rick just not long ago. Uh, just phenomenal people that are out there teaching. And and they, they tell me the same thing. They heard the same stories. And one of the things I want to get back to is you mentioned this, is that they learn a little different. Yeah. Well, the military has figured this out. Obviously, we're, we're trying to figure it out. And, but I, I hate hearing that phrase because the military takes the same age group of people. They put them you know, through training. They educate them. They give them a why. They put them in stressful combat situations that they have to perform complex strategic tactical maneuvers. They do it with pinpoint accuracy and it costs billions of dollars and they protect our freedom, but yet there's something wrong with this next generation. I just don't get it. And I think the biggest thing, and I think you'll agree with me, and I'll let you talk a little bit about that, is what are they doing different that we're not doing? What have they figured out that we haven't figured out? I think the biggest thing is is the approach about how they teach uh, these new recruits and everybody's got a strong point. So whether your strong point, I believe in the military is you had someone that was big in video games, they might be good at flying drones. Uh, you might have, you know, other things. So with the firefighting series, uh, I believe just finding the strong points and learning how people learn and gather the information and go from there about what's the best way for them to uh, achieve their uh, success in the fire service. And not lowering the standard, but changing the, might, the ways that we might teach our students uh, to be so better successful and have a successful career in fire service. And, and, you know, one of the things that I do this in se several of my classes, and I'll ask the young guys or young girls, I say, you want me to change the slide, don't you? And they shake their head, yeah. It's been up there way too long, boss. I'm telling you. But, you know, for the old folks, they're like, can you back up three slides? I didn't get all that. So somewhere in there, you have to be able to uh, capture that dynamic that fits the group that you're with. But again, you know, we heard today just just a few minutes ago about, you know, how a 15 year old, that there was a problem out on, on the, uh, Jason Pope, superintendent of the fire academy, said out on his farm with one of the, the barn doors. And he said, yeah, this is going to take us a while to fix. And we'll jump on it this weekend, whatever. And then his son tells him when he gets in, he's like, hey, man, I got that door fixed. And, of course, it's like anything else we do. you got to trust but verify. He even said that. So he went down there, and, he, and his son said, yeah, I found a YouTube video. And he said, after I watched the video, it took me about 10 minutes. I had to study the door to figure out really what was wrong. But after I watched the video, it took me about 10 minutes to fix. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and here, Jason, you know, he's been around a while. He's been in education for a number of years, uh, even working at the fire academy previously before he went into other careers and and involvements in the fire service now back there as a superintendent. It's like, yeah, you know, and again, we have to adapt. And I think that's one of the things that we're not good at is this is the way we've always done it. That, that horrific phrase that we have to, to, to remember that we say a lot. And, you know, when, when I think about changes, there are a lot of things that have changed in our business and, I remember when I got in, one of the, the things that I was given was three-quarter boots. Billy was talking about this. He actually put a picture up, and I'm like, yeah, I could be that guy. Uh, three-quarter boots, rubber coat, wool lining, corduroy collar, orange fireball gloves, plastic camera, great big shield. They gave me a sponge, and that was the filter brief. And I think about that, and a lot's changed. Uh, a lot's changed about our environments. A lot's changed about how we do business or tactics, you know, and how we go about doing them. Uh, we're still applying water. We're, we're still doing searches. We're still doing those things. But how we go about it, what we know is different. And that's kind of like one of our sponsors that, you know, is on you know, for the show. And that's Tinkata. And if you think about it, you know, that gear that we wore for those number of years was trusted forever. You know, and, and Tinkata has been a company that's been trusted for, for a number of years now. And, you know, their, their Flex outer shell that, that's out there, it's Flex 7 is what it's known as. And it's it's perfectly, you know, developed to where it, it's like wears great. And it's flexible, it's comfortable, it's empowering for the strength. You know, all this technology has gone into it. Now, here's another piece that we talk about. When I started, uh, 
we had stick people that were in the books. Honest to God, that's really what it was like. We had we had stick pe- people, we had drawings, and now we get to see you know videos and interactive videos, things like that. So w- when we talk about the, the change in the gear, and if you're interested in Tenkata stuff, I'll, I'll let y'all take a look at it. You can go to TenkataFabrics.com and then do backslash Flex Seven, and that'll show you that new powered and forced technology, but you know, thinking about how much has changed in our technology, our gear, all those type of things, and how we're having to teach. There, there's other components now we're having to teach and get people to understand is we dress you up well. We put you in the best protective ensembles, and the environments are much different. The energy levels are much higher. The temperature levels really haven't changed that much. In fact, we've reduced the temperature it takes to get the flash over because of the products and things. But how do we go about educating your folks to understand their past but embrace the current and then start enhancing or flavoring your future i think for me and i've always seen it in the classes i teach is really to understand where we're currently at is to understand where we came from and uh, the biggest thing is i always like to start talking about the past understanding where what we came from the respect and understand where we go to and how we move forward and basically where what was happened for us and the forefathers and sisters brothers and sisters that's done stuff for us and what what have they done what have they achieved to get us uh to where we're at uh, currently today um through uh training burns through different evolutions and just understanding as well too and adapting to our students different learning behaviors and learning patterns of how they how they overcome and learning difficulties because it's a lot of a lot of our students now as you can see they're not they haven't really been engaged with farm equipment or grew up they grew up differently uh we had back in Lancaster County we have a high school program that uh, for 12 years now we've we put out a great number of firefighters we put out Close to 80 firefighter twos and right at 40 firefighters have came out full time uh, with that. And from that, we just we get a wide variety of they, uh, they went to the fire department with their dads and, and moms and aunts and uncles before uh, before they got to join themselves. So they've been around their whole life. They get it. And they grew up in the country to uh, the very urban setting with you know, uh, never, never ran a chainsaw before. So how do we look at the vast, uh, wide variety of students that we get and narrow it down to making sure everybody understands the material uh, as they move forward in their career? Well, and I, I think a lot of what we've got to do is, is embrace the differences that are out there. Um, Man, I tell you what, it's, it's it's just amazing to think back at all the changes that we've seen in the fire service through the number of years. And, you know, one of them is the gear, specifically the technology that's there, uh, the ability to determine things. I mean, when I started, there were not thermal imaging cameras. Now you have the ability to size things up so much better. Uh, you know, right off the bat, a size up with the thermal imaging camera gives you so much more information. And I think that we have to begin teaching different. And I can think about some of the ways that I was being taught by some people when I I got in. And then one particular instructor by the name of Rick Rice, um, he he was a younger, cutting edge type person. And and what he was doing was a little bit different. And I think that's what we've got to do. And we got to match up to our audiences. and, And that's a big, big piece is understanding who we're talking to how they learn, how they understand, because the biggest thing is in education today, uh, when I came along, because I'm an old guy now, I'm, I'm like one of those those guys that, you know, all of a sudden you turn around and you, you're one of them crusty old salts, but they taught us to do nothing but, you know, two plus two is four, we quantify. Today, they want you to quantify, look at the kids doing modern math, you got to quantify, but you also got to qualify. Everything has the why or the how, 
and those type of things. It's not just, okay, two plus two is four, but okay, we know that that's the answer, but how do you qualify? And, you know, one of the examples I use in that in class is like two plus two is four, but one plus three is four, three plus one is four. If you take five and subtract one, you got four. There's a lot of ways to get to that. And, and I think that that's one of those components. And by thinking that way, and you mentioned that some of the, the folks that we have and, and the youth coming into the fire service today grew up a little different. I understand times have changed. And I, I would be remiss if it didn't tell you what just popped in my mind was the iconic, uh, you know, clip that Chief Brunacini's in when he's talking about the guy and, and the chainsaw. They don't know how to run chainsaw. They don't know how to start chainsaw. And he and he uses the verb. And he says, well, well, what are you, the chainsaw whisperer? He says, my God, think about it. Maybe you teach them and train them. What a novel concept. And that just sticks out in my mind. I can see Chief sitting there. I can see him having this conversation, you know, on a video. And in reality, he nailed it. I mean, this is like a home run out of the park. And maybe that's what we need to focus on a little more is we, we need to focus on how they learn and, and, and teaching them some things a little different. And let's go back to, to my sponge. I literally was given a sponge and I was like trying to figure out what the sponge was for. And it was kind of smaller. And I'm like, this makes no sense. And so I inquiring minds, I, I was one of the Y generations in 79. I'm like, well, why do I have this thing? And they look back, and that's another one of those times, well, I don't know what we're going to do with this next generation. It's like, well, I didn't know the why behind it. It was for filter breathing. And here's Rick Rice saying, uh, those SCBAs in there, yeah, they're fussing. They're going to call you a lot of names. You're not going to like the names, but guess what? Wear that SCBA. You'll appreciate it later. And you know, I went the first couple of fires, and I had to be like the old guys. I put that sponge in or tried to. And a lot of times they were just eating it, so I tried eating it. And I'm not the smartest guy, but after like two or three fires, I'm blowing black stuff out of my nose, and I'm coughing, my eyes are watering. I'm like, this, this, this is not the smartest thing. So I wore that SCBA like they taught me, and it was like, man, this is a whole different world. This is great. And, you know, you look at it now, and even – you know, Chief Goldfair was talking about this, about the cancers and, you know, his journeys that he's had. And, and I can talk about a number of our people here that, that have and how aggressive we've been with trying to prevent cancer and, and the treatments and adding extra tests into our physicals that's above and beyond in FPA standards so that we're taking care of our folks. And, and cancer is a big deal. And we're talking about cancer. That's some of the wellness stuff that, you know, continues to be talked about. But... You know, uh, one of our sponsors is, is really focused in on that type of stuff in the cancer world and preventing us from getting bad things in the stations and in their environments on a gear. And that's Magna Grip with the source capture. And, you know, honestly, if you're breathing diesel fumes or coming out of truck, even with the clean air systems that are on them today, you're still not breathing good stuff. You know, it's not healthy. So over time, we know that these are carcinogenic and they build up and our body just continues to, you know, use these. It causes, you know, metamorphic changes and manifestations in the body. But, you know, with them, a source capture gives a feature that is almost a hundred percent guaranteed. You're not going to breathe that stuff because it's a, it's a seal factor. It's source capture. It comes out and, you know, we, the department I'm with, we're very fortunate. Uh, under a grant, we got source capture systems, and we actually have the magnet grips. You just you know, throw that out there, but it comes in on a grant, and you know, AFGs and some of those things. But think about it, you know, educating our folks. We're we're talking about educating them about the fire service. This is part of the fire service. These are things that our young folks need to see, and and wearing that nasty gear and wearing that you know, suited up helmet, and just because you think it's burned up, you think it's cool, and, and all that stuff. Now, I, I get it. When we go to fires and we get in there, you know, it's there, but, you know, we we have the ability to decon our gear through washing it. We have the ability through products that can do field decon. Uh, we know that we need to be taking showers. There's research that's going on about saunas. 
you know, one of the things that we can fix very simple is we don't have to walk around and have diesel soot and fumes and everything in the station because it's source captured by, by magnet grip. But, you know, getting people to change because we haven't done that. And that's some of the old folks. So how do you go about educating people in that concept? How do you get them to embrace something new? I guess the big thing is, like, like we stated at the beginning, is just starts at that company officer level. And sometimes the scariest thing is, especially for rookie firefighters, is they don't know what they don't know. Uh, they come into the service and they just, they're they're green and they're expecting, hey, I'm here, I want to learn. Sometimes that company officer might be that old school company officer that says, well, I believe that they came through recruit school, they should know everything. And just changing that environment around the firehouse and going from that aspect of just taking them and teaching them about um, hey, starting from the beginning of this is what cancer does. This is how you get it. And prevention of of cancer through our gear, through the technology of, hey, after every fire, how about wash your gear? Uh, that look of that dirty, gringy helmet, hey, you're not, you're just carrying around cancer on your head. And washing your gear through those extractors um, and hooking up, like I said, through magnet grip uh, with your exhaust, what does that do? So, uh, educating our future folks as they come in, just just being that that good company officer at that level and being there for your guys, because you set the tone for your entire crew. Uh, how do you want how do you want your crew to be memorized, and how do you want them to truly operate on a scene? Is uh, what we always say. So you set the tone, and we're there for the taxpayers. We're there for uh, the next uh, the next call. So do we want to get on scene and operate in, in a smoothly fashion, or is it going to look like a cluster? Absolutely. And, you know, the, the biggest thing that, that we talked about a little bit today, one of our programs, they had ATF in, and they were talking about, you know, near misses and line of duty deaths and, and you know, what you need to do, what you have to do. And they, they were walking down through that. And, of course, the National Firefighters Foundation – uh, has a lot of that documentation. We're very, very fortunate in the state of South Carolina in the Fire Chief's Handbook. It is uh, a product that was produced by multiple groups, but the, it was updated in July of this year by the South Carolina Firefighters Association. Um, it, it actually tells you all the stuff that you need to be doing. Uh, we also have the groups that respond out from the state fire marshal's office, from the Firefighters Association, from the Chiefs Peer team, all these folks that come out, you know, it, it's just phenomenal what we have for resources that other places may not have. But when everything comes down to it, it's just like your training. One of the things that he mentioned was, okay, we're doing this training, and this is what happens so often. And, and uh, I want to hammer this home. I, I'm going to, I'm going to beat some folks up over this. So y'all get ready. I'm going to step on your toes. I'm not, not going to apologize because I'm an equal opportunity offender. But we do so much in educating and training people that we never, ever document. We never capture what we did. We never put down really what it covered. We, we just really get very, very vague at that. And as we, we listen to today, you know, that's one of the things that the OSHA groups are going to ask for that, you know, uh, NOSH is going to be looking for. Uh, lawyers and attorneys will be looking for curriculums and what objectives did you cover. And all that comes back to documentation. Uh, from an ISO world, and if, if you followed the podcast that I did on ISO and documentation and what you needed to have for training, uh, I, I find every day that we're doing so much more that we're leaving on the table, we're not capturing, we're not documenting. Um, is that the same for you? So. And that, that really hits home for me, Doug, because I was sitting next to a very dear friend of mine, Glenn Hasty. He's the uh, chief of TKK Power Department in the upstate of South Carolina as well. And we was talking about the documentation and really how I'm going to have to change my documentation of setting the objectives and setting and, note and documenting on how uh, out my training is going. Um, it really hits home for me because in... Uh, August of 2011, my cousin, Dennis Cawthon, passed away on a fire. He, he was a line of duty death. 
And with that, I was in recruit school and we was at lunch and the I got notified through the news that he passed away. And with that is when they come in with a line of duty death, they're looking at everything. They're looking from train records to gear to SUV logs to truck checkoffs uh, to everything. And so with that documentation, it, it really sets the tone for you as the company officer. Are you really looking after your individuals, your crew, for if something does happen? So we always live in a world of what if. Well, that what if is simply starts by not just training, but simply it really starts by checking the truck off. Because what if you go to that fire and you know your SCBA was at 3,500 instead of 4,500? So uh, that documentation, that really sets the tone. And, you know, the biggest thing about documentation is that's one of those necessary evils and people don't like having to do that. It's, it's the mundane, routine, everything that goes on. Company officers, guess what? I'm going to step on your toes. You're responsible. It is your responsibility to document all the things that you do on a daily basis. And, you know, I know people writing in the old log books and things like that, but when, when you're trying to get data out of a log book, that's that's a very slow process to do. Uh, and I'm going to throw this out, and this is kind of unique. Some of the stuff that I had scheduled to talk about just kind of lines up with our sponsors for the show. But in net, emergency networking, we know that everything we do all day long, every second that we have is important. From the time we got the train to the time we got to respond to calls to the time we got to get out of the station to the time it takes us to get dressed to the time it takes us to get lines on the ground. And Billy, Billy Goldfeder talked about that and showed several examples of good and bad yesterday. But we know that nothing, just like in the world of EMS, nothing occurred unless it was what? Documented. So if you... You could have took 20 blood pressures, but if you didn't put down but one, you didn't take the one blood pressure. So, like, what did you do in training? What did you cover? What were the objectives? What were the skills? All those things. So, the emergency network, we know seconds count for us every day in the response, on the job, how we do our business. But it also, when we get back to the station so that we're capturing everything we need, we need to be able to do it efficiently and effectively and be able to have our records in one place that it can be pulled and you know out, especially when, when we're talking about we need something for ISO, we need something because somebody was injured, we need something because we're documenting a need, especially when it comes to budget time. So Emergency Network does all that. It's your fire and EMS solution in a sense. And basically it's online, it has an offline functionality, it's highly customizable, so you can do a lot of things with it. And every organization, and, and that, that, that's a facet, every organization is different, and you have to customize what you're documenting based on where you're at. Because it could be that you know you run an engine and a ladder. Well, in another department, they just run a, a quint, so you, you're documenting things different. So, I mean, it, it, it's that way. So th this is one of those things. And if you're interested in that, you know, go to emergencynetworking.com. You can see the product. But kind of back at hand here, um, and it's great to have all four of these sponsors, IFSA, Tenkata, MagnaGrip, and Emergency uh, Networking. But kind of back to hand, you know, training. We started out with that concept. We started out with the company officers are, are critically important. Uh the fact that we've got a lot of younger folks coming in, the, the uh, Gen Xers are leaving, the uh, the folks that were before them are leaving, leaving, you know, the baby boomers are gone for the most part. I mean, some of us are still hanging out. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm right on that edge. It depends on who you ask, where I fall. And then you got all this new millennials that are in here and how they learn, how they interact. But, one of the things that I can tell you in all the research that I've done, and, I, and I've conducted this stuff from, you know, local to across the United States, and, and I'm going to tell you, the younger generation wants us 
to engage them. They want to be engaged. And are you seeing that? And the biggest thing I see is they just want they just want that mentorship and they want that opportunity uh, for that investment because, uh, especially with this younger generation, some of them not, might not have the best home life. Uh, I see that through the high school program as well as through our volunteers as well. And this is our, their true way to excel themselves and make a name for themselves. And how do we do that? That's being company officers and being mentors in the firehouse and engaging those uh, new members and setting that tone, setting that tone because uh, it's big. I'm, I'm blessed to be on the Sacramento Task Force One. And on the wall, we say train like we operate and operate like we train. And that really hits home, especially in the firehouse. So once that alarm sounds, how are you going to operate? You're going to operate just like you uh, like you did when you trained. And uh, setting that tone as that company officer really, it, it, it shows on the firehouse. It really does. So, you know, we've been going a good amount of time here. We've talked about a lot of different things. Uh, one of the keys that I'm going to go back to, I'm going to reiterate this again, is the company officers are the true trainers of the fire service. If we're not engaged as company officers, if your company officers are not engaged from a, a administrative level, then you've got to do something about that because we're missing out. We're losing that main cog in the gear mechanism system that makes everything roll and turn. And they're the ones that spend the most time with them. They're there with them 24 hours a day uh, on the career side, on the volunteer nights that they're coming in to train. They're associated with them. They're, they're helping groom them. They're, they're mentoring. They're doing all this type of stuff. So we got to do that. So with all that said, what's some of your, your final thoughts to wrap all this up? So being a, uh, being a volunteer fire chief is also as the county train officer is just uh, how do we, Engage uh, the newcomers in. How do we make sure? Because we always talk about well, there's a shortage of firefighters and there's a shortage of volunteers all across this nation. Well, uh, can we change that culture? Can we change that environment to make it more welcoming? But at the same time, don't lower the standard. Um, so my biggest thing, my biggest takeaway would be don't lower the standard. But maybe we need to change our ways of looking at how we change, uh, train these upcoming and newer uh, members of the fire service. That's a good, good point. Uh, just to throw out, um, one of the things you can't see, you see palm trees behind us, but uh, we're sitting here and uh, one of the programs or the series that, that I've been working on and done so much on was uh, resort operations. Well, we're at a resort. We're at a high-rise resort, so it's on the coast, so tactical considerations go there. Uh, one of the pieces I will throw out is how we train for rural operations is different from how we train for suburban operations and how we train for urbanized operations. And again, uh, going back to what Bobby, when he was at the conference uh, the year before he passed away, he told me that you know, this is this is a focus that you need to get in. He said, you're the guy that's in all these resorts. You have campgrounds, you have rivers, uh, you have waterways, you have high rises, you have mid rises. You have all these things to talk about, about resorts. And that's what you need to do for FDIC. And he, he gave me that opportunity last year to do pre-con on that. Uh, so he got its opportunity to do that. We've done a series on... Uh, fire and training about uh, resort firefighting operations. The last one had talked about rural operations. And, you know, I, I brought in uh, 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 Greta from out in Colorado. And she, you talk about rural. I mean, they're, they're like dropping pins to figure out where they're going and how to get there. And, and, you know, that type of deal. So, but they're resorts. I mean, and some of the resorts you described were much different than the ones we're sitting at today. But again, you have to adapt your training and your programs to not only your people, but your situation, your awareness that you're at and um, what you're going to be responding to. And you need to tailor it to that. And that's something that a lot of folks try to do. They train on the wrong things. They need to train on the right things and the things that are in their operational purviews of how they're going to operate or what they're going to be expected to do and how they operate. So 
It's great. Well, Brent, thank you for coming on the show with me. It's awesome, awesome to be here. Well, we're proud. Uh, we appreciate you. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, I know you've got a big vision for the South Carolina Fire Rescue Instructors. Uh, as the first vice uh, chair of that, president of that, and moving some things forward. I look forward to seeing what you do with it. Uh, enjoyed having you here and had enjoyed having you on the show. Uh, got to thank our sponsors, man. It's great to have four sponsors for the show. Uh, when you've got ISTA and talking about the training manuals and all the information they've got, you, you look at new technology and the new things with Tenkata and their, their gear, the Flex 7, you know, component of that. Uh, and, and then MagnaGrip, what they're doing for source capture and the prevention of cancer in the fire stations. And then emergency networking, what they're, they're providing for capturing your day and, and doing things that you, you can pull true data from. And that's what we need. We need to be data driven. We need to be da- data driven. And that's a topic that I'm going to talk about uh, on a future show about data driven training, what we need to be doing. So we need to be capturing the style of data so that we can appropriately train our members the way that they're supposed to. So uh, again, thank you for joining us. Thank our listeners for tuning in to Fire and Training. I'm your host, Douglas Klein. Uh, again, the program is dedicated to making sure everyone goes home, getting information to the men and women who are in their streets 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, responding to the call, responding to alarms, taking care of citizens' needs. And again, it's focused on getting you home to your significant others and your families. Uh, Again, stay safe, train hard, train often. We'll see you on another edition of Fire and Train. IFSTA is dedicated to updating firefighting techniques and safety through the creation of our manuals, apps, curriculum, resource one, and more. Our high-quality, technically accurate, and affordable training and education materials have made us a worldwide leader of the fire service. Visit us at ifsta.org for more information. Like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric delivers a perfectly broken-in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of enforced technology, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit tenkatafabrics.com slash Flex 7. Flex 7, powered by enforced technology. Only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics. Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit magnagrip.com. Seconds count when responding to an emergency. Minutes save count when documenting your day. Emergency networking makes records management easier and faster with its Fire and EMS solution. User-friendly, complete online and offline functionality, highly customizable, all at an affordable price. For more information, please visit emergencynetworking.com.